So then you go into another relationship and then your fans... You announce that you're back, and they're all you, happy. Exactly. Meanwhile, it's round two of the same thing. Exactly. And yeah. six months down the line again, your fans won't be able to, to access you. So I think I understand what you're saying. And I, I, I take your point that, of course, we, we do it from a privileged position. But I did not shoot Gurulego on culture until I, I, grind, I, I, I grinded on Itiski and I made enough money. And then I bought equipment and I did not shoot for 12 months. So I did not shoot. I was I was grinding and making money and, and getting equipment. When that was straight and I knew I could pay for, for people I need to pay for, for Ngulego and culture, then I started shooting. There is no, there's no need for people. I've seen a lot of YouTube channels where people are shooting out of uh, excitement and then they stop shooting. They stop. Like they start and then they stop. Bro, I think, uh, to be honest, it's like 10% of podcasts are still shooting. Yeah, from a year ago, kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's exactly, like a New yeah. Year's resolution thing. It's a, it's a. In fact, a, 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 I was reading somewhere that many podcasts don't make it beyond episode twelve. Like only uh -huh. like something like crazy, like twenty something percent makes it beyond episode twelve. Uh -huh. and then episode twenty, Xala five percent. And and it makes sense because yeah. people are shooting from excitement. They it, they it then dawns on them that this thing is very difficult. Yeah. Um, because you have to pay equipment. This alone costs ten thousand. Yeah. You know, and you have to, once you sort out the equipment, even the consistency of being able to avail yourself to shoot for two hours, that's literally, that's work, mm. right? But you're not going to be paid for it um, because there's no guarantee that you're going to be making money from the episode yeah. and the numbers are discouraging as well. Um, but just on that, Ziggy, just to wrap it up very quickly, I think that she doesn't need to shoot anytime now um, until every, all the circumstances are right. Um you know, uh, there are plans behind the scenes. Uh, maybe she's speaking to a couple of more people for different, um, you know, options. Mm -hmm. The one option is to use a studio and shoot from there. Maybe the other option, which I've been advocating for when I was speaking to her, is that, you know, just um, save budget, we'll help out where we need to help out. Um, and then we get equipment and then you shoot from your house. Um, and you know that you own everything that's here. You know, I know that's a difficult option, but I'm saying like, I didn't shoot Ngulego on culture until I got money from Itiski. So I was not um, uh, I was not anxious or excited to shoot until I was ready to shoot. Yeah. And when I was when I got sick um, a few months ago and I was stressed out with content, everything because I've been I've been shooting every week at least three or four times, shooting something at least three or four times. And then I got a little bit sick mentally and I was drained um, because I'd been shooting for ten months consecutively, at least three things every single week yeah and I, I i took 10 days off and i, I spoke to her and i was like yo i know it's affecting your bread too but i just need to take this time off when i felt better i started shooting again and we started from shooting one thing per week just to ease my way back into this and then we're back now to shooting two things a week like literally uploading uh, two things a week on good on culture so i say that to say there is no need for you after you come from the pressure of a breakup with another channel to immediately go to another channel okay. because the other channel will have the other relationships will have their own um challenges as well and then within two months you're gonna clubana with them to relax uh, the year has ended already come back next come back next year you'll be straight you'll be cool like things i said to her like yo you already are a personality unlike us who had to build value for ourselves like because we're not already like um known personalities whether you are known people know your name you have 360,000 followers, followers on, on twitter, twitter and it's real people know, exactly. <laughs> people already know you so you don't have to build you know so but all you have to do just work on a game plan come back next month next year next year maybe by june you'll be straight but i think there is like the excitement to want to shoot um largely because the fan base is demanding more but they don't have to put pressure on her she will come back um when the time is right i think um i hope though because i'm not uh, she's not gonna do what i say yeah uh verbatim she, she may have a difference of, of opinion and feel like she needs to shoot as early as next week you know and there's nothing i can do about that but i i do hope that because the year has ended you don't have to shoot you don't have any obligation you don't have tina at it is we have world sports betting there's sponsors obligation that mm -hmm. if we don't shoot we don't potentially make four hundred thousand or 300,000. That means mouths um, are being affected because we have like maybe 15 to 20 people yeah. uh, that work for us across the business. Mm -hmm. So we do have obligations that we need to fulfill with sponsors and we need to shoot. But you don't have to shoot. Like Ngulego and Culture, I don't have to shoot. You know, I have an obligation to the fan base, but it's like, ah, guys, I'm telling you that I'm sick. I'm going to come back when I'm, when I'm good. 
I, I want to shift quickly to, to, to a bit of politics because I, I, I always find your opinions interesting about this. <laughs> <laughs> so for those who, not, for those who, uh, who are not aware, um, Gluleg and I shot before. He came to Durban. I'm at, his, I'm at his place today. He came to Durban. We shot and the footage got corrupted. And something that we spoke about that I, I don't want to not speak about again is the sustainability of this coalition government. If you know Gluleg or you know that he's always about... Um, we need coalition 2024, otherwise we doomed. Um, we have load shedding. Even now we are awaiting load shedding. We now prepare our lives around load shedding. But Nkolulego, are coalitions our solution or it's the best thing, it's the next best thing we have and because we are so out of options? Yeah, I, I speak about coalitions because mathematically and logically that's where we are going. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how it looks like we are going because there's been um, a steady decline of the African National Congress at the national elections that logically what will happen next is them dipping on less than 54%. And they're... Um, 50%, sorry. They were on 54% the last time around, or 55 Um All roads lead to coalition now because they will get 45%. They might even get... If they have a horrible performance, they might even get to 40%. Mm -hmm. Now, all roads lead to coalitions because... What we already know about the opposition is that there's no opposition that's going to get an outright 51% yes. uh, majority. So I'm not for or against uh, coalitions. I'm just, I speak about them because I know that that's where we are going. It looks like the likeliest route that we are headed to um, or headed towards. Um, it's weird because Rob Herzog is speaking about coalitions and I'm worried about that. When that man is speaking about coalitions, it's like, hey. You're like, why are my ideas aligned with this man? <laughs> <laughs> like, no, there's a reason why. And, yeah. and, 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 and Andle Mutama was here and he was saying, no. Yeah. Specifically, he said, look, he, for him, he's, 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 he's winning either way. Whether the ANC wins, he wins because Ramaphosa is his person. Um, the way he's speaking about Ramaphosa is like a father um, was disappointed by his child. Uh, the child not implementing ideas. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, um, yeah. And... Mayor, sorry, sure. uh, uh, Mayor Chris Papa, as I asked him um, if Sil Ramaphosa uh, is a, 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 speaks the principles of the DA. Is that why they love him so much? Yeah. And he said, isn't Sil Ramaphosa an extension of the DA? And he laughed, ha, ha, ha. And it was a joke moment. I found that so true. Ugogo uh, Obrumachiko says that uh, coincidentally, knowingly or unknowingly, the DA stumbles upon the fact that the, they don't need to govern in order for their policies to be, <laughs> to be passed. Yeah. They realize that through the African National Congress, they can be able to, you know, protect whiteness, yes. serve the interests of yes. whiteness, advance the interests of whiteness. Yeah. So I think that's where we are. Um, whatever we think of Sudo Ramaphosa, uh, the African National Congress does a very good job of protecting white people, um, advancing the interests of white people, um, you know, they speak left, but they walk right, you know, so anything that you think of um, about the ANC uh, not being adequate, it is what it is. Like, there's nothing we can say about that. You can have, maybe if you interview someone who's a staunch ANC person, they can twist it uh, because they are being evil and full of nonsense, which they usually are politicians, all of them, whether it's ANC or DA or EFF, um, you know, they will, they will try... Every time they have an audience, uh, they will always protect their political party. But I think all roads lead to coalitions. I think um, there's nothing we can do about that now. Um, and I think that it's it's strange because there's something happened in Ekur, in Ekuruleni, um, and I was following the story just that yeah. I, do, I don't I care. I, I have enough of I don't care in my body mm -hmm. that I will watch something unfold and I'll read about Objectively. it. Uh, and then I'm like, I forget about it. But yeah. I remember that uh, Julius Malema was explaining that um, there was an agreement in principle that the ANC and the EFF were going to vote together in mm -hmm. Ekuruleni um, to topple the DA and then they will have their own mayor. Mm -hmm. And then I suppose the what he explained, Julius Malema, was that the ANC reneged on that, on that agreement. Mbalula was speaking to him. I think Mzola Lemasina was speaking to him on the night before the vote. And I think they betrayed one another, uh, the ANC. Uh, what Julius Malema is insinuating when he spoke to Colin Lambi on Newsroom Africa was that um, the ANC betrayed them such that, that by the time uh, it, was, it was voting time for someone in DA, um, sorry, in Tswane, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, I just forgot her name. Mm -hmm. It was the current mayor now. When it was time to vote for her, uh, they then got their back on the ANC 
by deciding not to vote, even though they decided in principle that they not would vote. Is not for that? Mayor Tenya Campbell? Yeah, something like that. Yes, something yes, like one that. of those. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was it was that because it yeah. was uh, Colum Lambis. Uh, they they Lambis opted speaking. not to vote. I remember. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And 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 the, the explanation there was that the 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 ANC had betrayed the EFF uh, from the original agreement. So it is those kind of things and those kind of politics that give you an idea of what you expect in 2024. You know, and it will um, it will be a lot of stops and starts um, in 2024. Because in order for the opposition's uh, opposition parties to have an outright majority and have a coalition government, they're going to have to combine all of their votes together. And five percent will mean a lot. Two uh, percent will mean a lot in that. Because say, for example, that they just just through the collection of all of their votes, they get to fifty-two percent or fifty-five percent. It means that any time. Um, because I'm sure there will be agreements, uh, coalition agreement, agreements to say, okay, Tina as the PA, we have 4% and we would like to have a ministry in education or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they, they persuade each other. Eventually they agree on whatever they agree to. But if that's not delivered on, then they will decide that they can take this vote to the ANC who needs that 4% to be a ruling party again. And maybe they could be given what they're looking for. You know, So there will be a lot of stops and starts. Um, and those stops and starts, uh, Andrew Mutama was saying that Rob Harrisov funds all political parties anyways. All of those things will be to his, to, to, to his advantage. All of the smaller parties... Uh, like Action SA or PA, and Lemuntama was alleging when I spoke to him that they are being funded by Rob Harrisoff, and I have no reason not to believe that. Why, why is he the spokesperson of White Monopoly at the moment? How did they elect him, and he's going around and 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 just driving a narrative? Why specifically him? I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm scared. I'm terrified of Rob Harrisoff. Um, um, I don't know why he's speaking. Um, it's interesting to me. White money never speaks. Old exactly, money never speaks. Exactly. It's, it's silently I've in Bishop's the, Court I've, in. I've had the same How question thin, as well. You know? I've, I've had the same question as well, Uguti. Like for me, it's this is not something that we're used to. And um, you know, but it's revealing enough. I think mm -hmm. that it's helpful because it's revealing enough. It's revealing because in his in his in his own speeches or in his own interviews, he reveals more about himself every single time he speaks. And that's why it's not a coincidence that in the past two months he hasn't done any interview. Because I've been observing critically. Um, the things that he goes around saying, um, the way that he speaks about people, he speaks about politicians as if is, those are his, uh, those are his employees, mm -hmm. and and maybe they are his He's employees. Like, I, I called Malula the other day. It's like, wait, wait, <laughs> dude, just just like that, you just call people. He he'll literally say things like that. You're right. Yeah, and yeah. He was like <laughs> Cyril, we put Cyril in a position to do this. We put Patrice in a position. I'm like, yo, we put, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And exactly. And maybe it speaks to uh, I was internalizing this thing as well um, about black people who have money. Um, you never see them have a point of view, whether they have millions and whether they have uh, hundreds of millions, multimillionaires. They never really have a point of view. They are always wishy-washy. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are always worried about losing their bread. Whether there's controversy around them. Whether they are content creators. Whether they are musicians. You, you, you're um, correct. They, you they, know, they don't stand for anything. Exactly. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's as if... I don't know what's the point, bro. Like, I, in my lifetime, I'm going to make 50 to 100 million. I know that for a fact. In my lifetime, if I live to see 60, I'm going to make 50 to 100 million. I have this attitude that I have now, even though I'm not a millionaire. Like... I, I have this attitude of being cavalier and, and have my say and quit jobs yeah. um, if I'm not being serviced. But I look at some black millionaires and I'm like, ha, huh, if you guys are our children's uh, role models, w then our children should not aspire to be you guys because you are always worried about losing your endorsement, losing your radio jobs, uh, losing your corporate jobs. You are know, like every single time you see black millionaires speak, you, you always know that, Oh, this person says yes, boss, to someone, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 I've been internalizing that, and I'm like, ah, man, we 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 live almost in something that is like a conspiracy. It's like there's never any true liberation for our people, um, you know. Even if you're Patrice Mutsepe, you have a Rob Herself who speaks down on you, because Patrice Mutsepe is boss, boss. But yeah. it's like, yo, you can have someone who says our family gave his father this first business and this, and he speaks to him like he's a is a boy. And I'm like, nah, man. So what does this mean about us? I know that there are people who make serious money, who are black, who have a point of view. But I'm saying the majority, particularly the ones that are paraded in the media as though they should be our children's heroes, they have no point of view at all. Any controversy, they send an apology. Even though they were not involved in anything, anything, like 
they can't even date multiple women if they want to, if they feel like it, because they are products. They are walking, talking products, and they are worried about losing their bread. What bread? How much bread is, is the bread that you are worried about? Mina, if I get 10 million, bro, I, can, I, cho- I choose to walk away. Yeah. Because I have enough money to last me a lifetime. Also, if, you, if, you're, if you're a billionaire, and like these people you are saying, they're billionaires, and they've got interest in so many companies, I, 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 I'm, as much as these people own the means of power, who you say yes, boss to, I'm sure you've got money hidden in other countries. You've had enough time to hide money. Yeah. So what are you so scared to lose? Yeah, and they're, they're setting a bad example for, yeah. for, for, for future black millionaires and future black leaders as well because they are always wishy-washy. They, they have no point of view. Um, you know, and you look at them and you're like, ah, you, you people want to act as if they are role mo- you are role models, but you own nothing. Every single time they pass away, you figure out that they didn't actually own this, they didn't actually own that. I think that that's a, that's a, that's problematic, uh, and I don't aspire to that. Like that's why I'm always counterculture when it comes to that. That I don't want any attention from uh, to to get. I don't want to receive any attention. Um, I, I I I seek for attention as a function to increase um the viewership and the subscriber base for my channels and that's it not for myself because i think that mina i will have i will be a rotten millionaire yeah because i'll speak my mind i will <laughs> I I speak knowing that i have 10 10 million and yeah. i can live like because yeah. even now i have the attitude of i can live if it, yeah. it is anything anything there that's any type of way and I'm, I'm with africans people and stuff like that anything that's any type of way i have this thing in my heart where i'm like well i can leave this Mm. I don't have to do that. It's irrational to do that. We'll make a lot of money if we stay together as a disco media, you know. But anything where people say some stuff the type of way, I have this thing in my heart where I'm like, I can leave. Because I'm 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 not fearful of poverty. I come from it. I don't want to live in poverty. But what's the point, bro, of having 20 million? You can't even say anything. What's the point of that? What kind of future millionaires are we breeding if we're going to have black people um, who are like that? So I say that in relation to this thing of coalition parties and politicians, it seems as though they will always sing to, to a master uh, one way or the other. They will always be run by, by groups of people. And I think even voting is a ritualistic uh, thing. Like we choose once every four years to vote for people and we are participating in our own oppression. Mm. We are deciding what we are going to vote for political parties. And even if, even when it's revealed to us that there is no change fundamentally, because even if we do coalition parties, and I think that this is a very good experiment, coalition parties, let's see whether or not that leads to an ESCOM problem being alleviated, considering that the first time we had load shedding, bouts of load shedding was 2006, 2007. Let's see then, and we've had uh, maybe 2009 was an opportunity to vote. That's one. 2014, two. 2019, three. We've had three opportunities to vote uh, and we can vote out whoever is in power so that they can solve the problem of load shedding. Now, we will have a different party. I I, I strongly, I, I strongly um, uh, suspect that we'll have a different party, which is going to be a coalition party ruling the country. But see what happens to ESCOM and whether or not it doesn't speak to the conspiracy of people wanting to fundamentally destroy, uh, deliberately, destroy yeah. exactly, deliberately destroy and undercut to ESCOM from being a functional parastatal so that then they then sell it to their friends in, in private hands so that they then, whatever is worth a hundred uh, rands worth of electricity, it could be 200 rands mm. and we can't do anything about yeah. it. It could be 300 rands. It can't, we can't do anything about it. 300 rands for 50 units and there's nothing we can do about it. You know, so it's like a, a an ongoing running conspiracy. Every time I think about it, and I'm like, yo, but it's like we, every time we vote, and it's important that we do, but it's like there is no fundamental change. There's absolutely nothing that changes um, every time we vote. Interesting thing about 2024, which we started in this chair with different guests that I had, was that in 2024, if the Democratic Alliance have the highest percentage of um, that vote, which they will, because they usually have 25%. White people are not ambiguous about who they are. Yeah. They will always give their vote to the DA. White people are 9% of this country, but the DA always over delivers. They will always get 25, 24%. They could get up to 30% now because white people will definitely vote for them or the Friend of Front Plus. And then black people will join uh, the DA and vote for the DA to add to that 9%. They will get them to 30%. And they will rule the country, which will mean that 
there will be the opposition with the highest percentage, which means that a president will most likely come, come from, from them, them. Yeah. Um, which could either be Helen Zilla. It could. It, it will obviously be uh, John Steen Hazen. Compromise could be Helen Zilla, or compromise could be that they could find a black person within that party. They no longer have Lindy Omazebogo. They no longer have Musima Imane. So they don't have an obvious candidate. Pumzile Van Dam is not even there. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have an obvious uh, candidate to put out as a black token president so that they can... Because it will look bad. The optics of it will look bad. Uh, black people will then scratch their heads and say, hold on, what have we just done? We've elected a white person as a president. White people are only 9% of the population in this country. Yeah. That's, that, that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen in any country in the world where a member of a minority becomes a president. Mm. It happened in America with Barack Obama, but that was a huge anomaly. And his mother is white as well. And of course, he... He, he he continued with um, Democrat and, Republi yes. and Republican politics anyways. He continued with, with wars. He created other wars. They say he's a drone uh, strikes president because apparently he killed more people with drones than any other president in the history of America. So it, 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 was, a, it, it was a farcical thing to give you the impression that we are an inclusive country when they are not. Um, you know, so I, I don't think um, there's anything that's going to fundamentally change in 2024 other than the fact that we're going to select a coalition government and a white president will emerge from that and black people will be like a slap in the face. They will be like, what have we just done to ourselves? But what what is the alternative for the people? I, I, I also want to speak more about um, the, the black people because you speak about there are a lot of black tycoons, black millionaires um, who through government tenders, because everybody tenders, by the way, bid vest tenders for work and gets yeah. it um, however they get it. Um, white corporates tender, consulting firms tender, everybody tenders for work with, to work with government or to work with other companies, right? But particularly black people who've made hundreds of millions from tendering, you saying they, they are not ins good inspirations to younger black people. Um, two, um, do you think there's a deliberate attack on them at the moment? Because all of them seem to owe tax. And why, why aren't they paying their taxes? Yeah, I'm thinking people I'm, are earning as, as owing asking, 30 million tax. As you're asking that question, I'm thinking that is it not. Are they, do they not exactly you answer the question by yeah. yourself in a way? Because I was I, I was watching Tokyo Sikhwale speak about the Chris Ani matter on mm -hmm. Newsroom Africa, but I, saw, I was watching it on YouTube and I watched 20 minutes of it. Um, you know, and I started thinking about black people, black men, black women who have made millions. And I think about why is it that they're not vocal? Um, speaking to the topic we spoke about earlier. Yeah. And I was saying this to someone that it is possible that every single time uh, that a phone call or an email, uh, you know, pops up. Probably a phone call. A uh, phone call or <laughs> yeah. an email. Just to remind you, yeah. uh, uh, remember that we have your nudes. Remember mm. that we have your... Uh, you in compromised position. We have your recordings in this. That's what the Americans do when they have alliance partners with Europeans, Germans, um, and whoever is taking the side of an American enemy when, in whatever era, um, the FBI will come knocking and they will say, we have recordings of you, um, you know, engaging in illegal activity, talking about tax evasion, um, talking about maybe child, um, I don't want to mention the word because we're yeah. on YouTube, I don't want to affect your episode, you know. Um, so I think they, the way that they acquire their wealth in Abu is questionable, mm -hmm. questionable enough that they don't have any leg to stand on with regards to standing up for black people and speaking out against things that they see because maybe the way that they acquire their wealth is compromising and someone can always leak out information deliberately to say that. Because, I mean, we are seeing some of the celebrities, Carol Bauer as well, mm -hmm. um, was in the news. Um, and then um, Terry Petto was part of a group of a lot of people. There's another um, events planner who's big in Durban. She's in a, she's she's fighting with some municipality, I think Gokstad, for mm. not building a stadium. Mm. What does she know about building a stadium as, a, as an events planner? <laughs> like... <laughs> Guys, yeah, and she probably has a high grade in the construction industry. How do you get that high grade? Where, 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 where are you skilled? As, as, the, as the director of the company, surely there should be laws in place that says at least one of you needs to be a professional engineer. Full stop. We, we mustn't speak too, too much about that. It shouldn't be negotiated. Yeah, you know? yeah. How do you get those grades if you're a majority shareholder of a company that is, 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 is specifically doing construction and that's their speciality? Yeah, no, so for sure, like... I think, in a way, you've answered your question because I wonder about them and I wonder that what should our kids aspire to then if black millionaires, people with hundreds of millions cannot speak out? 
And then maybe in a way we are answering the question that, but then that's problematic too, because does that mean that in general, uh, in order for you to become a black millionaire, um, you must you, be corrupt. Yeah, 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 and that's that's not a message I want to put out to the world. Um, I take that back. But is is there is there? Can you honestly say you know a black millionaire right now that you can think of from the top of a hat? Give me three names. That is, you you feel they've made their money clean and they're a multi super multi millionaire. Um. Well, you can't know whether or not people made mm -hmm. their money clean. But your perception of yeah, the their perception, journey, yeah, 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 yeah. does it look clean? I, I would look at entertainers. I mean, yeah. I think Trevor Noah is an, is an entertainer, right? Mm -hmm. And I think um, he's a multimillionaire in South yeah. African rands. Yeah. Um, Black Coffee is an entertainer as well, but yeah. there are files about him, this and that. But I don't know that for a fact. Whenever I see him, um, and I saw a, a recent episode of him on becoming a CEO. Whenever I see him, I say, okay, cool. He's a multimillionaire. He's an entertainer. And there are other people as well, like I, who, who I may not be exposed to, yeah. who, who, who got their money right and got their money straight. And I also aspire to get my money straight, mm. you know, and I want to pay my taxes and stuff like that. So, and I currently pay my taxes, um, you know, so I don't want to put out the message to the world um, that black people are inherently corrupt because... Um, I live in a white neighborhood and some of my neighbors are corrupt. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> they are corrupt millionaires. So it's not a black thing, but I'm just saying maybe the reason why some of these prominent black um, multi-millionaires, because to be a millionaire takes you one million, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, 10 million is not a lot of money for some people, but there are people who have a hundred million net worth, 200 million net worth, half a, half a billion net worth, um, who perhaps have questionable past and maybe that's why they can't speak out that's why they can't even uh, you know sometimes i even question this thing of why we don't have our own institutions where we can spread our propaganda big radio stations that are outside the sapc which are owned by black people specifically or exclusively um you know big tv channels owned by black people exclusively um you know why can't they do that and they help spread our propaganda if 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 there's racist um, programming that's coming from American programming, which is um, uh, streamed on on South African television, yeah. why can't we have black people uh, who are multimillionaires or have serious money uh, to create a counter to that, a counter narrative to that? You know, but uh, what we do know, this is conspiratorial, but we also speak to enough politicians uh, who are trying to know that whenever there there are those kind of people who are trying to fund good causes. Uh, they do eventually get, get a phone a phone call, yeah. Uh, and there's a threat of your assets being frozen and this and that. Uh, so that's a problem. That's a problem. But I, I'm worried that um, we're gonna raise a bunch of kids that are not able to stand up because they are worried that Nivea is gonna pull out, Pons is gonna pull out, or whatever, like whatever their sponsor is is gonna pull out. And we're living in a culture where it, there is a corporate hegemony. You know, corporates are deciding, and even us on YouTube, we can't say certain words now. Yeah. You know, because there's a corporate hegemony. Like corporates are deciding what kind of things we are we are talking about um, on on content. I mean, I I have one of, I had one of the dopest conversations, and and of course it was very uh, emotionally draining and difficult for both of us. I spoke to uh, Uzulu Barb, who was working in the industry. Um, we had um, I don't want to mention the P word because yeah. you see. <laughs> um, you know, and 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 we had close to two hundred thousand people watch that episode, and um, eventually I was like, okay, cool, this is a cool niche I could have, like two a lot of, of these, these people. Um, two of these per month, because I want to have a balance. You know, I want to have happy stories and sad stories. You know, but as soon as I did the second and third then the money starts to be dropped. Like, it starts to be limited. You get the yellow sign. Exactly. The <laughs> yellow sign for monetization. Um, and you can see that the the impressions are self served less. So from 200,000, and then there's a more horrendous story with the sexy antler. Um, it's a more horrendous story that would have done super, super huge numbers, but it got compressed and compressed that it got only 20 something thousand. Maybe we're struggling to coexist then as, as people. And maybe the solution that we live in silos and we're pushing too much for rainbow nationism as the world. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, we should be living in silos and respect each other's boundaries in those separate silos. I'll make an example. Um, people like the, 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 the Muslim community, they make sure they create their little communities and they hardly exist outside of those communities unless maybe it's business and they need the mass to access the masses yeah. to come and support those businesses or to work in their businesses. But m maybe as people, we need to be honest with ourselves that we, st we are struggling to coexist. 
as the different communities? Yeah. I it's not something I've really invested so much thought in, but perhaps just to react to or respond to what you're saying. Um, I think we have a problem if we're going to force people um, to see the world from our uh, perspective. You know, we're going to struggle, particularly if we force people to mm -hmm. see. Like, I know I'm a Kosa person. I'm proud of my language. I love it. Um, but when I'm in Joburg, then I learn Sutu. Um, I learn Zulu. And I... I, I I, I engage in this podcast in English so that then a vendor person can understand, um, a Tsonga person can understand, a Betty person can understand, you know. And um, I cannot impose Kosa and Kosa culture. We have our own definition, for example, of what a man is in Isa Kosa, in Kosa, right? Um, but that's not necessarily a definition of what a man is in Zulu, in Sutu, in Tswana, in Betty, you know. And, and I say, I recognize every male adult as a man, mm -hmm. like in daughter. You know, um, even though when I engage with another closer person, we then have to speak a specific, even our greeting must be specific yeah. uh, so that then we can ascertain where we are, where, mm -hmm. where do we stand. You know, it's like a coded language, yeah. you know, but I cannot then impose, impose that yeah. on, on other people because they're not part of that. You know, so I think you, are co I, you learn to coexist with people through that. But I do think that I've had a problem with the way that things have happened uh, so much so such that um, we are forcing people to, 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 to not be able to express themselves proper. Um, I don't want people to be killed. I don't want people to be oppressed fundamentally. Um, but I don't want people's speech to be limited um, and restricted if they're not advocating for the killing of groups of people, for, for, for things that really, you know, I, this thing is wrong. Yeah, but, but this thing of, for example... Um, controlling speech so that then if i say you are a woman when i see a woman can't do when you recognize yourself as a man i'm misgendering you this lack of empathy that we can teach each other in that moment and educate each other in that moment um or go to oh okay so you're saying you are a woman but i see an image of a man because i've lived in a society where a man looks like you then that's a problem uh secondly we have to have a very um constructive conversation about the participation of LGBTQI community uh, members in sports, in things like sports, particularly the transgender issue. Um, how do we resolve that? You know, and, and the transgender community must be able to understand that there is an inherent advantage in me being Ngululego as a male man now, and then transitioning into becoming a woman, and then go to boxing to fight against a woman who is not transitioned. That's a conversation to be had, and we need to have a degree of empathy. We cannot have people being shut down for saying or speaking out about those. And the people that do speak out, we cannot have people speaking out in a way that then encourages the physical bodily harm of those people. You know, so we need to have a, a degree of empathy. I think that there's a huge lack of that fundamentally. Um, you know, and then the thing of coexisting is something that we've always had to do. Yeah. Um, because we are a country which we're not a monolith country where in Denmark everyone speaks the Danish language mm -hmm. uh, or in China predominantly people speak um, what is the language Mandarin. in China? Mandarin, yeah. thank you. Um, you know, predominantly everyone yeah. speaks Mandarin. So we're not that kind of country. So we've always had to coexist with people. We've always knew, we've known, me coming from the Western Cape, I've always known about the existence of Sutu people. I've always known about the existence of Pedi people, True Generations, Muvango, all of these programs. And I'm like, okay, cool. Whenever I engage with them, then I will have to know that this is a Tsonga person. And then we, I, I cannot impose my course on, on them and they cannot impose their Tsonga on me. You know, so coexistence is very, very important. But I think we are being disingenuous in the way that we 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 address some of these issues. Uh, Dave Chappelle mentioned something very important in one of his comedy specials, and he kept on mentioning it until it happened uh, that at the time that there was a Me Too movement uh, and women were speaking out, it seemed as though it was not enough that they speak out and they talk about these men. Uh, they they wanted exclusively that their stories to be believable. They wanted exclusively that. Be, believe me and take the bread galungelo because lungelo uh, sexually assaulted me in in year xyz right and we could not question that and now we have to fold our arms as men and we have to be historically we have to be reminded our of our pasts that we've been oppressors of women uh, in those feminist um narratives now every single time an allegation is made we have to test it logically we would say oh okay you're saying that this happened 
to you. It, it was done by this man. And you are reporting it on Facebook. Have you considered going to the police station? Because if Lungano does something to me physically, I have to go to the police station. If I retaliate, I must understand the consequences that are going to happen to me as well. So people wanted to have a fundamental right of speaking out against people and wanting them to lose their bread without having those tested. And that's why you had a DJ Fresh uh, case. I don't know what happened to that because I wasn't following it. But I know that there were allegations and euphonic. And then there, were, there was a text from that young woman that you know, she was lying or something like that. Um, and then it's like those people are consequenced. Um, and they were on radio at the time, uh, on 947 or something like that at the time. And they were consequenced and they were taken off air. Their bread was affected. But the person then had said that it did not exactly happen. There was a recent story now. Uh, with a young woman who alleged uh, being sexually assaulted by a young man. I think they are high school students. And then the young man hung himself. Um, and we lost a human being. And, and it, it was a false a, a, a accusation. So so I, I, I hear you, Nkolego. It's, it's, you're saying that um, the narrative at the moment is it's, it's towards that when an allegation is made, there is no room for testing. Yeah. And once you test, you are an apologist. You're considered an apologist for whatever exactly, that, yeah, that, what violence, yeah, yeah. that violence yeah. is, right? We, we are being blackmailed into not speaking out because we'll be called uh, but, apologists. But, but in Kulego, the, the, the statistics are saying that a overwhelming majority is true. And as humans, it's fair to then act accordingly because an overwhelming majority of those cases are true. Right, these anomalies are now happening. We are seeing the anomalies happen. Yeah. So we need to find a good balance so between what, uh, let testing. Me, let me ask you what must happen. What must happen? So I'm saying what must what must happen when an allegation is made. I'm saying why, we, why why must it be taken to the court of public opinion? What what must happen? You make an allegation against me. Mm -hmm. Now it is TV must fire me. Me. What, are we, are we abandoning the idea of going to a police station and saying, this has happened to me? And sometimes you have to go to the clinic, you get a Z88 form or whatever it's called there, and then they will say, the doctor will say, I've seen this wound and that wound and that wound, mm -hmm. and then you take it to the police station. Now you can argue about the inadequacies of the police station. I was about but, to go there. But, yeah. but that is the only recognized uh, framework within which we exist, and it's better than the court of public opinion. You can get lawyers... Uh, you can, but I know it's difficult when mm -hmm. you you come from the township to get anything being followed up, up upon. But it's a much better system than a system of court of public opinion. Because what do you want to happen? You are, you are reporting it there on Twitter or Facebook. In order for what to happen, you you are raising awareness, awareness, and then in order for what to happen, I must lose his job, and then in order for what to happen, like. Until what happens? At what point do you go to the police station and report? And then you can go to Twitter and say, here's the case number. I've opened it. There's no follow-up. Yeah, but you go and open. You say, this is... So I get me. you. You're saying that um, the logical route is to follow the system that exists. Yes. The framework that is there to protect you. And if the framework is failing to protect you, then you have a right to go out there. Because it's, it's almost as if you are, you are saying... I, I can't afford anything beyond this and I'm still not getting justice. Yes. And, and now also, there's and, a social and, and, media that exists. You can do it even concurrently. You can open yeah. a case even when they're following it up properly. You can write on social media if you feel like it. Although at some point in court, that could be used against you. If I'm not mistaken, like you are prejudicing the case. Um, you are making false allegations about this person. Maybe you added an, an additional layer of information which you did not mention to the clinic you. when you were writing on social media. So you are messing up your case in the first place. Because what must like, you know, Dave Chappelle, when he, when he said something about this cancel culture and Me Too, um, he, he didn't say this exactly, but he was insinuating that something is going to happen here with these men. Because what you are trying to address is a monster, but you are you are addressing it in a monstrous way. You are addressing it in a way that it knows how to play. You are playing the game exactly the way that they know how to play. So what is going to happen is that somewhere down the line, people are going to stop listening. And at some point, people stop listening to these young women. At some point. And the other thing is that now, it. so young men, they do commit atrocities. Uh, they take from young women. Um, when they do, unfortunately, they take predominantly, and this is this is a reality. Predominantly, we make relations as young men and young women, 
and predominantly it's successful. She consents, you kiss, and you do whatever you, you do because you are happy, you are young. Yes. It's not a pandemic that people are being sexually assaulted. It just so happens that it does happen. And, 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 and there are significant numbers to that effect. So when you take it, statistically speaking, randomly, today, there are lovers teenagers young adults they, they they are kissing each other and they it's and they are consenting Pre predominantly predominantly right? they are consenting but we're also and recognizing then, that one is too many of, exa exactly. of it being taken exa away from exactly. you without your consent exactly because th you don't want that to happen but yes. that happens yeah now what is happening is that people their bread is taken from them right um they are being smeared and eventually they are exonerated at some point. And it's not just your bread, because you can be a public figure, which means they are, there's a whole family tree of people yeah. who have... Who are affected. Who are affected because of your success. Yeah. Or the lack of success in it, your exactly. life. Exactly. And, and then what happens is, I need to explain this in a way that makes sense. I hope I, I, hope I will. A culture emerges from that. You are reporting people. There are false allegations. And some of them are correct, and people lose their bread. Some people get um, arrested. But with this Me Too culture, it became a court of public opinion where people are piling on and piling on and piling on. Now, imagine what will happen then in a sense. So you're creating a new culture where young males knew that there is a consequence to what they are doing. Mm -hmm. They are taking, right? But there will be consequences uh, depending on whether the young woman reports it, um, you know. But then. Now, with this new culture, you are making these young men double down on what they're doing. So they are taking, but they know what will come afterwards. The um, pylon on social media, getting arrested, which he should be arrested. What he works out in that moment is, I might as well take a life too. Because he understands what will happen. It's like, I might as well get rid of the potential for the person to speak out against me. So they took, because you said no, and then they go on to take a life too. And there was a rise of those kind of cases where people take, and I'm, I'm not blaming people reporting it. I'm saying when they see what happened to other young men who did or did not do um, what they were accused of, they then double down. And then when they find themselves in a state of panic when they are taking which they shouldn't take, they work out that this thing is going to explode. I'm gonna lose, I'm gonna lose this, I'm gonna lose that, I'm gonna lose that. Instead of just being arrested, then they double down and they take. That's why I said I wanted to make this point properly. I don't know if I'm expressing it properly. You, you, I, I, I'm hearing you. So what do we do in Gulego? What do we do because we're saying we, we, we don't like cancel culture. We're agreeing that it has its elements that are doubling down. It has its elements that are taking bread from people, people's families. Um, and once again, just as uh, one lady or one queer person being violated is one too many. Yeah. One and a man's bread being taken away is also one too many. This is these are livelihoods. Yeah. One person's bread being taken away, especially those bread where they didn't do anything wrong, it is also one too many. Yeah. I would like to appeal to people who are activists and people who are social media personalities. Um, I think that a lot of people are cynical. Um, a lot of people are cynical and they choose sides. When someone is a feminist. They stand with whatever a woman is saying. I think that that's wrong. And I think that's potentially dangerous because what you are doing is encouraging other young women who are 12 years old, 13 years old, 17 years old, 18 years old to have that approach to life. You cannot have that. If, based on what I'm looking at in front of me, I see logic or evidence of someone lying about someone, taking from them, I should then be able to say, look... <sighs> the evidence suggests that this did not happen to you. But what happens is people are, are very cynical because they have sides that they've chosen. Um, they then say, I wait to, um, anyways, men take from women. Yeah, well, unfortunately, we're on YouTube. We even have to use words like take mm. to avoid the word that we should be yeah. using. Um, and I, we apologize for that. You know, And then you, the, 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 the feminist activist says, I were to men take, mm. so we have to always believe the victim. I think that that's wrong, and I think that that's um, insidious. Um, it's not helpful for our country, um, and it's not helpful for the world as well. I think that you know within your heart, I don't know how, what kind of a human being goes to goes to bed at night uh, knowing what they're supporting a point of view which is wrong, 
Ugutu Lungelo is in prison for a false accusation. And I am supporting it, but I know it's a false accusation just because I am known as this activist. It's the same thing with these uh, social media personalities who are cynical about when young women are expressing their pain. Um, Uguti, this has happened to me. My father did this to me. Um, and then they find a way, they find ways in which to articulate why your father arrived at the point where they, they, they felt like they need to take from you. So we need a balanced um, outlook in life. There is no, There are no easy answers, unfortunately. Um, ideally, in an ideal world, like whenever something happens to you, someone must, ar- must be arrested, mm. ideally. Um, what I don't want is a bunch of young women thinking that uh, writing long posts on Facebook is a solution. It's not. It's not. You're exposing yourself, one. And secondly, you're not reporting that in, in a police station, you're not going to the clinic and making sure, uh, I don't know whether you prep, land or whatever they they, they get. Pep, pep. pep, yes. Thank you. You get the you pill know. after being violated. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. And and just um, make sure that you do those things. Of course, in an ideal world, we would say those things must not happen to you. But we know that as a function of um, a colonial apartheid South Africa and poor people coexisting in those spaces, the townships, they take. Um, in fact, this country is more dangerous for young men um, than it is for, for young black men than it is for any other groups of people in this country. True. Because it, 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 it generates 20,000 murders per year. 20,000 murders per year. And that's black on black because in every uh, township there's shippings and there's negative stuff that's happening. You're talking this way about my girl. Yeah. You're talking this way about my sneakers and then we stab each other. And we're other. both drunk or we're both high. So Absolutely. we and act we stab, irrationally. And we stab each other. And I've yeah. seen it. Uh, where I come from. So this country is more dangerous for young black men. That's why whenever I'm being interviewed, I say I can't go to my township. I do go like five minutes and I'm gone. It's like I'm I'm uh, I'm, a, I'm I'm a myth. People say basically I'm born and we, we <laughs> saw him, but wasn't yeah. really here type of yeah. thing. I'm in and out because I'm always aware of the danger that exists, and it's not a danger that's uh, that has anything to do with me. It's a danger of the haves and the have-nots. The the kids will will, will target you because they know that now you are. You are on the class of the haves, and we are the we are we are the have-nots, and we need what you have, you know. And that you have to understand that, you know, and you have to understand that that's that that's the, a place that um, produces violence uh, as a result of the structural planning of apartheid of putting our people in those places, um, you know. And it's, it's not an excuse, but that's that's the kind of human being that comes from there. We take. I had to train myself that no is no. And I've never had a problem not knowing that no is no, but I had to train myself that, yo, if she's saying no, she's saying no. And I've left women in hotels, like literally paid for everything, flights and everything like that. And when they're playing hard to get, I'm like, I have to leave. And I've left. But I know that p- people from my township, considering that four or 5,000 has already been spent. They think they've they bought their way into that. They've bought consent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They will have a problem understanding that that's a no. And it's a no. You know, and, and, and you have to leave. And I'm like, and the person, sometimes they're just testing you. They're testing your resolve and they don't want to look like they're easy. And I'm like, nah, bro, like, that's a, it's, your no is a no for me and I leave. And I've left on more than one occasion uh, and more than one night. It's not like I have a problem with that. I've been successful in other nights, but like I've had these kind of nice ways, like you have to leave, you know, but that takes training and self-discipline uh, to know that that's a no, you have to take it and then you have to leave, you know. But the township doesn't pro- produce... Uh, rational thinking human beings because it's not a space for that, you know, and that's why the township produces 20,000 murders of black men uh, every year. It changes sometimes 15,000, sometimes 16,000. That's a lot of people. Yeah, it is. Every 24, four, uh, every 12 month period. Yeah. That's a lot of people. But I think um, we are very cynical. We are very cynical. This, the feminist is extremely feministic, and the, the guys who are part of the menosphere that want to talk about men's rights, they are extremely on the other side as well. And they think that they are the brands and they want, they have to rep- uh, represent young men. They, respira- they represent masculinity exactly. and what masculinity is meant to look like. Yeah. It's a shame. It's a shame because young men are actually impressionable yeah. and they listen to that message. But I would, I would also not want young men to listen to the feministic message because now it's extreme. It's extreme. It makes you feel as though you don't deserve anything as a man in this world. You know, you deserve death if not anything in this world. And I think that that's a, that's a very bad message. And it's, it's very corrosive and insidious. It's not a message that I would like young black men to consume. The, the, the ANC is going to bless us with load shedding soon. Oh, so, yes, yes, <laughs> so, yes. so we need to wrap up. 
Okay. Um, firstly, thank you, bro, for inviting me to your beautiful studio. Uh, I, I'm finally part of the Nkolulego on Culture family now, I think. <laughs> you must come through for an interview. Yeah, yeah. Um, family a bit before we close off because you are a person, you're a human. I'm seeing that you, you, you're you more stabilizing. Gonna into your Hrudman era. Wakum <laughs> deni kanga, we are pela, we are puma guko. Uh, is that deliberate? And do you think that uh, family is still an important thing we should maintain fundamentally as humans? And are families really so important in what makes the world happen and yeah, be Dr. functional? Dr. Francis Cress Welsing advises us that as black people, we should not have any children before the age of 30. Mm -hmm. um, we should not have any children uh, five or 10 years apart. Um, so one child, uh, three or four years, another child, and then maybe three children, and then you're done. And you must not have any children um, before the age of 30. You must be 30, be educated, get a job, and then you can focus on having children. Um, she discourages children from having children. Mm -hmm. When I was 22, I was a child when I had my daughter. Um, I've been fortunate enough that she's the only one <clears throat> and she's 10 now um, and I'm 32. And, um, you know, I learned a lot from people like that and Dr. Amos Wilson. They gave us, they gave, a, they gave a lot of teachings about um, when there's a man and a woman in a household, um, it gives the child the best possible uh, um, chance to be a thriving human being in the I world. You. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm violent and I'm emotional largely because I've never really had a male figure, mm -hmm. um, but you then learn to suppress that. You know that there are consequences to mm -hmm. being violent. Mm -hmm. You know that there are consequences in business for being make, for making emotional decisions. You know, so I'm violent and emotional. I, I, I recognize that, but I'm not. Like, I don't express it. I just know that internally I'm, I'm so, um, there's so many things that are wrong here internally and that I'm trying to work on. Um, but they don't express themselves. Like I've, I've dealt with you, I've dealt with Jaujelo, and I deal with a lot of people with decency and respect. You know, but in terms of family, um, in order for kids to thrive, um, you need to have a man and a woman um, in that environment. Of course, that's like a heterosexual world that I'm expressing. Um, maybe in in, a, in, a, in an LGBTQI um, framework, you just need a, 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 a you need family. A man. Yeah, you need two stability. Human beings, yes, who um, are invested in growing in, this person. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, in that sense of yeah. heterosexual, that you need they they need that and. I've tried to do that. But yeah. but there's, um, I, re I actually read this yesterday. I can't remember the name. She's a behavioral scientist. Sure. Um, and she says the most, the happiest people in the world are unmarried single women. No, it doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound right at all. Kevin Samuels, just go and consume a lot of Kevin Samuels yeah. content with single women who mm -hmm. are 30, 40, 45, 50, all of them, there's like some rage inside of them uh, and there's a lot of frustration inside of them um, because there is a window of opportunity as a woman um, that is your best possible chance of having your ideal mate, like the ideal man who earns the ideal salary, who will give you the ideal life. That window shrinks at some point um, when you are after 30, um, somewhere between 25 and 30, it still exists. It doesn't completely close because you can always get someone. But the ideal guy um, who's going to provide the ideal environment, money-wise, um, who's going to provide the ideal environment with the suburb that you 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 you, 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 you live in and, and the suburb you prefer, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so that does that doesn't sound right for me. But uh, because you you have a lot of evidence that shows that a lot of um, black women are frustrated uh, because they invest. The, or they invest their womb or they give their womb to the wrong guys at a certain age and, and they have regrets about that. You know, Gandhi, the guy that they generally looking for, the guy who earns uh, the guy. So you and I are anomalies that um, we, in our lifetimes, you are under 30, right? Yeah, 28. And I'm 32. In our lifetimes, I've already made the first million. Yeah. Right? Um, but that's only one... To ten percent of the global population, yeah. people will make their first million um, under thirty, mm -hmm. or at precisely thirty. So that's the ideal guy for the woman. Besides the looks and everything else, that's the ideal guy because she understands that there's the potential for a stable environment is provided by the person because they can buy a home, 
um, the children can go to a certain school without her having to pay any expense at all mm -hmm. because that's the ideal thing. She would rather look after um, the household and the children as well. I, I think it's in eight within them, although modern women have now been trained to be part of the corporate sector yeah. um, and, and work. And of course, no one is, 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 is holding them back from not working if they want to. So they, I, the ideal mate is a guy like me and you. Um, and, and, and a guy like me and you was straight. Our ideal mate is converse that the older they grow, then we look for the younger. So between 18 and 25, that's where we're looking for. Because Tina, our attraction is the physical. So a woman would be at her physical peak yeah, in terms of attraction that at that age. At 18, she, she will be the thinnest when she's 18. <laughs> um, yeah, well, and I'm not objectifying, I'm just being logical. She'll be the thinnest when she's 18, when she starts working. It, of course, even Nami, I was 60. When I entered the workplace, when I was 20, I dropped off university. I was 65 kgs. Now I'm 100 kgs after working and eating bad sleeping patterns. And I've this is the product of that Yeah. At, at 32. Of course, I'm working on that. I can reverse that, you know. Um, so what we're looking for is males, particularly males who've made millions or who are millionaires, um, is something that looks the part for because generally speaking when you are a, a young male who's a millionaire even when you're 45 which is the around the age where people make their first million mm -hmm. in general the average people make their first million even when you are that um you are that because you are part of a corporate environment you go to meetings business meetings functions and workshops what you want is to look the part a young gorgeous woman um to 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 go to these meetings with and these workshops with and these conventions with so there's a tendency then to look at between 18 and 25 because that's the peak physically of women and this is not objectification this is mm. human behavior if it wasn't happening in in this world then i wouldn't be breaking it down that way and a lot of people who've invested time in researching that have have, have, have found that that's the thing you know and that's why um 40 50 year old men look for 21 year old young women and yeah. not their age mates. Exactly, <laughs> because it, she's 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 missed the win she's outside the window of her peak attra uh, attraction. Although she can randomly find a guy who is not the one that she would like ideally, she can randomly find a guy. Maybe they 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 have a chemistry, but it's not the guy who has twenty five million, who has forty five million, who will make her not have to pay for anything. Mm. And that's what I I seek as well. Like seek to provide that I wanna be the guy who provides the house so that you don't have to work and stuff like that. And I'm, 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 I'm happy to be that guy. Um, so that I then have to, to worry about the creation and the work. And I don't have to worry. Like my daughter does homeworks at least five times a week. And none of that includes me. It involves me because maybe it's Afrikaans. Maybe it's a little bit difficult, but yeah. it happens once every two weeks. I don't want to be part of that. I don't want to, I want to, I don't want to reveal, relive my schooling experience. I, I didn't work hard so that I can do homeworks for children. <laughs> um, I would rather even buy a, a tutor. Yeah, but, but yeah, it's 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 best that you provide that kind of life so that for the it's fundamental for the development of your children. Yeah, bro. but that you have that kind of environment. If you cannot have it, it's cool. Like I, I'm more than happy to be a single parent if life puts me in that position. In that, in that position. Yeah. The show is engineer your life. I'm Lungelo Kehem. He's he, yo, he, yo, yo. he keeps on telling us that he's got a lot of millions. So I don't have <laughs> at all, at all, at all. I'm I'll gonna, see. I'm gonna make money. Yeah, I'll see you guys in the next episode. Thank you, Kulego, bro. Thank you.